Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us for this Missouri Prairie Foundation webinar. We are thrilled to have three um, wonderful ecologists uh, joining us today to present to you braided streams of thought, meandering through groundwater discharge, wetland plants, and beaver complexes. My name is Carol David. I'm the Executive Director of the Missouri Prairie Foundation, and I'm going to introduce our speakers and then they will present. And if you have any questions during or after their presentation, please post them in the uh, Q&A um, feature at the bottom of your screen. And at the end of the presentation, which will be just about an hour in length, I will come back on and uh, uh, direct those questions to our speakers. And if, you, uh, if your question is for one speaker in particular, please mention that in your, um, in your post. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce our three speakers. Kyle Steele has 19 years of postgraduate experience in applied ecology, botany, and forest science. Although he has worked in numerous ecological regions of the country, a bulk of his time has been spent in the Ozarks. He has worked for various organizations, including the Missouri Department of Conservation, University of Missouri, and the Natural Resources Conservation Service. For the past seven years, he has served as the program manager for the Ecology and Soils programs on the Mark Twain National Forest. He specializes in ecological classification and mapping, coordinates various ecological monitoring studies and provides support for forest and restoration-based management on the Mark Twain National Forest. Frank Nelson has worked for the Missouri Department of Conservation, also referred to as MDC, for the past 20 years with various partners to help advance wetland conservation in Missouri. He has played different roles through strategic planning, research, working with wetland managers, renovating infrastructure, and communicating with the public. He now serves as the Wetland Systems Manager in MDC's statewide resource management branch and is working to conserve and promote the full spectrum of Missouri's wetlands, their biodiversity, and the benefits these critical habitats provide to people. Justin Thomas is the Science Director for the nonprofit organization Nature Site. For 26 years, he has conducted ecological and taxonomic research and instructed plant identification and ecology workshops. He teaches plant biology and vegetation of the Ozarks at Missouri University of Science and Technology, is the co-author of the Ecological Checklist of the Missouri Flora, also um, the, the, uh, known as the Floristic Quality Assessment of the Missouri Flora, and holds a research associateship at the Missouri Botanical Garden. Justin takes a holistic view of systems and processes to demonstrate how the emergent properties of systems, the qualities, are more than the sum of their parts, the quantities. And now I turn it over to our speakers. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, uh, Carol. Uh, the, um, really appreciate it. I'm going to kick it off here. Um, as you can see, we have three co-authors here, and we're going to it should be fun. We're going to meander through all kinds of uh, topics related to FENS and a project that we started about four or five years ago. And just on behalf of Frank and Justin, I really want to thank um, Carol and the Missouri Prairie Foundation for having us here. This is my first opportunity in, a, in an official capacity to participate with the Prairie Foundation. So it's really a, a dream come true. So thanks. Um, let's go ahead, Frank. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about this, again, this FEN project. You're going to hear this term karst FEN a lot, and, and so you'll learn a little bit more about that by over the next hour. But a little bit about the impetus for this project, why we did it. Um, we did bring a lot of existing information together, but we also have uh, 30 sites that we'll talk about site selection methodology. Um, we're going to talk about landscape context and, context and abiotic processes. So thinking about things like geology, hydrology, and some of those abiotic um, concepts related to fens. And then, of course, what most many of you are probably most interested in is plant communities and, and then what we call a state and transition model, which is how do we uh, put together all these different natural community concepts? Do they relate to each other or not? And if so, how? And then further, and maybe more importantly, what conditions do we currently have versus, yeah, we all love reference conditions and in, in state natural areas, but
But when it comes to fens, what conditions do we actually see today in the degraded landscape and what do they look like and how do they operate? And then finally, we'll talk a little bit about uh, management and restoration of fens. Uh, Carol, are you hearing me okay? Yes, I hear you fine. Okay, I saw a comment there that said Yes, audio. I noticed that too. Um, it's yeah. fine for me. Okay. Um, so uh, go ahead. So let's, I wanted to start and talk about this idea of a site concept. That is something in natural community classification circles or if you've heard of ecological sites or ecological classification and mapping, at the site scale, when we do, we we really need to define that sort of that range of conditions. Uh, often, some I like to call it defining nature's stage. So, what are those abiotic uh, criteria that produce the potential for a biotic system to occur? And it's basically kind of that sum summation of all these ecological. Uh, factors that that define a given uh, ecological site, in this case, karst fens. And so um, basically when it comes to fens, there's different um, people. Oh, no, go, go ahead, Frank, stay there. Um, different, oh, go back, Frank. Oh, sorry. You're, you you're fine, we're, we're figuring this out. So when it comes to the site concept of a karst fen, as with any fen, the, the overriding definition of any fen should be a groundwater dependent ecosystem. It's the place in a hydrologic life cycle where water ends. It's a discharge hydrologic environment. And usually these kinds of things produce a permanent to semi-permanent water table. So you have water flowing through an aquifer that uh, takes a lot to completely dry up. And you basically have permanent wet conditions at the surface in most fens. And those conditions produce really unique soil properties, which we'll talk about later. And then in, in this area, we have fens that aren't related to maybe places you some of you are used to up in Wisconsin, Iowa, Illinois, Minnesota, places like that, where a calcareous fen is usually defined as groundwater percolating through or glacial till that's calcareous and then coming out on a slope and producing a unique prairie-like environment. In this case, it's very different. This is Ozark-centric. This is karst-related. So you have water coming through a calcium-dominated geologic strata and then somehow going through karst caverns and then coming out springs and producing a similar environment that you might have in other kinds of fens, but very unique to the Ozarks. And in this, uh, this eco-region, we have a lot of habitat specialists and specialized ecological connections, which I'm gonna let Justin briefly touch on here for a second. Thanks, Kyle, you uh, you set that up really nicely. That's uh, a nice picture with the, the, the rainwater percolating through karst landscapes and exuding itself on the landscape as, as, as fins. Uh, a lot of folks probably listening know Ozark fins or karst fins as we're calling them as being different from up north. Um, one of the defining things besides the abiotic variables of fins are the biotic factors as, as Kyle alluded to. And one of the reasons they're so special, they're one of the most rich and they're also have m more rare species than most than probably any community uh, in the Ozarks and, and in Missouri as well. So here's just a list you can kind of go down real quick of, of the sort of relictual species of the list is 25 species of conservation concern, pretty much all of them plants. Um, there are various forms of relictual species. Um, we'll touch more on that later, but this just gives you a sense of of, of how they are, uh, these little wetland islands, sometimes bigger wetland islands, that hold a large portion of our, our, our biological diversity in the region. Thanks, Justin. So we just wanted to provide that really briefly because we're going to go into a lot of detail, but just just to really set the stage for where what what if, where we're at and what we're thinking about. So uh, impetus for the project, really, why did we do this project? It was something that um, really stems from the Missouri Ecological Classification System. 
that is a, a, a system of identifying and, and mapping and describing ecosystems at different scales. It, it, it uses the Forest Service ecological hierarchy, which I now work with in my role with the Forest Service now. Some people call it terrestrial ecological unit inventory. But um, basically that uh, system never accounted for fens. And you know that project went, started in the late 90s and went to the mid 2000s and fens just, we didn't have that strong site concept. We didn't have good information on where the soils occurred and how, why they occurred. We, didn't, we just didn't have enough information to come up with a solid ecological site or ecological land type. And so that was why we set out to do this project. Um, number one. And then also, you know, being an ecologist in the Ozarks, it's very clear. Yeah, there's been some effort. There's been some really phenomenal efforts on looking at fens, but we need more inventory. We need more mapping and we need more clarity. And going back to Justin, as soon as we asked him to be on this project, he immediately had a number of questions. Go ahead, Justin. Oh, sorry. That was yeah, look back up, my bad. Um, so the second, so with that, go ahead, Frank. Uh, with that, we wanted to do a team approach. And so I, I just, I don't like doing projects by myself. So I had a conference at one point at the Missouri Natural Resources Conference. I tapped Frank on the shoulder and I thought, well, Normally, he's working in the huge wetland landscapes of, of the Midwest and in the big river systems, for example. I've never known Frank to do a ton of work in the Ozarks, but I really wanted to see if we could get him here. And I asked him, he wanted to do it, and really thankful that the Department of Conservation supported his role in this. And once we got him on board, we thought, okay, we got both of us are dangerous with plant ecology and botany. Um, I have a soils background as well, Frank and his hydrology and wetland process background, we wanted to go to the best botanist we could find. And of course, we immediately thought of the preeminent botanist, Justin Thomas, uh, of this region. Fortunately, he was interested, and we were able to get a grant to fund his, his work in this project. Uh, so really briefly, we're going to go through our main project goals. And number one, when I do a project like this, I've done similar projects across the Midwest and other parts of the country. I want to synthesize the existing information. I want to do good by all the people that did work prior to us. That was my focus. We want to make sure that that information is dealt with properly. Um, so we have some really fantastic, one really fantastic thesis. We have Paul Nelson's Terrestrial Natural Communities of Missouri, which is a foundation. Um, once the Heinz Emerald Dragonfly, which is a, a critter that we found in Missouri and realized we had quite a population here, it became a federally endangered species. That was a third kind of pulse of information related to fens that we were able to, uh, you know, really glean a lot of new inventory and new study about where that species occurs in relation to fens and why. And then there was some additional work by a gentleman named Scott George that looked at some of, some of the abiotic stuff with springs and soils and, and so on. And, and if it was up to me, I probably would have stopped there, but that's why we brought in people like Frank and he, he really took it from there and, and made this into a, a really impressive literature review. Yeah, so I like to dig uh, into the literature a little bit and uh, was really interested in trying to compare and contrast how karst fins are different uh, from other fins in other places in the United States, uh, Canada, as well as Europe. And so, uh, that's where part of my uh, divergence went, uh, but then also through that process, also found information on uh, springs and seeps, as well as car systems, and uh, also uh, beaver dynamics. And so we'll get into that later. But then also, um, because of the soils, uh, carbon dynamics are also really critical. So uh, we've got some information from other sources that uh, are nice sideboards and what ways to kind of compare and contrast them. We'll get into some of that information as we, we go through this presentation. So, yeah, so if we put all this information together, and the other cool thing about that is we're going to have that synthesis, and we want this result of this to be a one-stop shop for people to, that want to learn about fens in the Ozarks. This is the summation of all that. Sure, go ahead and go to those original sources, but we just want 
to add that together in a, in a, a modern context. And so if we can do that, but then hopefully this isn't this is a priority, but it doesn't have to be. But we want to add new information in, in new inventory as well. So maybe we can add some new information to the body that of of work. And this is where I got a little mixed up with Justin before, but Justin immediately had a, a number of questions uh, that he was thinking about in this process. Yeah, and and you know, there's a there's a lot of fans. We'll get into sort of the distribution map in a minute, but there's a lot of fans in the Ozarks, and most people that have been to a lot of fans are amazed at how different each one is, and it's one of the reasons they're difficult to classify. And so, and it's a lot of questions emerge just from that alone. Um, if there's an abiotic driving factor there, that's going to be a plant soil relationship. So, what are the plant soil relationships? We lucked in or lucked out at having somebody like Kyle, who's an amazing soil scientist, who can get us a, a glimpse under the uh, under the rug of vegetation and, and kind of relate that to what we can find in the in the plant community itself. So, unanswered questions such as plant soil relationships. Um, what does fin health look like? There's a lot of fins in the Ozarks. A lot of them are beat up. What sort of a reference state? What would the, what that what would that look like? First, we got to determine how many different kinds there are. Those sort of things. Um, most of them are in most of the fins that in the Ozarks are in some form of hydrological uh, alteration or agricultural degradation. So teasing that out, and then ultimately, how do the abiotic factors, all those abiotic factors, relate to the biological features that we have, and in terms of their health and their and their perpetuity, and and managing and maintaining and and understanding these systems a little better that even though they've been glamorized and people love them, we don't, it's shocking how little we actually did know about them. And, and, and in fact, when we started the study, nobody, we, we didn't really know people, there wasn't any pool of data out there, people that actually laid down quadrats and collected quadrat level data from fins necessarily. So within the first fin, we laid down a quad, the first quadrat we laid down had to identify every pl plant. So the quadrat's like a, it's a one meter square writing down all the plants we'll get into the methodology in a minute but we're one of the plants we first see is this eliochrys on the left eliochrys elliptica which we looked at it and we thought well we've all just kind of been pretending that that's eliochrys varicosa but nobody's been really comfortable so we've all just kind of walked past it for decades you know so then we had to finally know well no but this is data we got to know what this is so we collect it, look at it a little more. Turns out it's Eliacris elliptica, which was new to Missouri, never been found in Missouri before. We later find that it's pretty much in every fin and any calcareous seed we have in the Ozark. So these are the these are the sort of intricacies that we don't didn't not quite know um, that that were that were surprising along the way. Carpa, another disjunct species, also found in in two fins in the region, as well as a lot of other fun surprises in the in the plant world as we went. Thanks, Justin. And then, of course, we want to publish this information. We want to get it out. And, and that is in progress. You'll hopefully have a publication on this in the coming months. And then finally, we want, we want this to integrate into management and USDA programs. Uh, Frank and I were invited on a site in Dent County in the heart of the Ozarks where, you know, a, a, a wetland reserve program site went in and um, you know, we, they didn't really know what to do with it. They didn't know what to do with a fan. And so we hope that we can get an ecological site description that can go into the USDA program so that when we have uh, fens showing up on the landscape, we can not only do the right thing, but do the right thing for fens. And then there's other relationships there uh, that Frank was going to elucidate yeah, here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, part of it is once we have this guide, then that should help, help us uh, to help uh, private land biologists and private land owners know what to do with fins that are on their property. And that's really important today, especially with uh, the recent decision between EPA and Sackett uh, in terms of there's really a lack of guidance and protections for wetlands, uh, especially isolated wetlands that weren't even covered uh, by the previous regulations. So having uh, a guidebook um, that helps define these and what's beneficial for uh, these habitats is critical. And so yeah, we'll hop here into the site selection and methodology. Yeah, the so the the site selection, there's you know 
documented there's 560 some odd fins there's probably more than that uh, across the ozarks trying to narrow that down into something that's that's usable and tangible and has representation of all the different uh, possible expressions um we turn to the larger ecological botanical conservation community in missouri which is wonderful and amazing and and everybody was very helpful and and helping compile a list of of, of great sites to use them um, And we narrowed it down to 30 sites. There's a list of the 30 sites. Some of them we put in a couple of plots in each. Um, then we collected data on those on those on those sites. We basically put in uh, two one meter quadrats next to each other that were going to be. And then we had the soil cores in relation to that. So we're trying to tie the soil core and the soil data to the immediate vegetation data, but at a quadrat scale. So we had just two two one meter quadrats per soil core we then collected a species list in the general area of anything we may have missed from uh, the actual quadrat levels themselves um and did a quick cursory review of mosses in the area collected the, the more common mosses we could possibly find which surprisingly there weren't as many mosses as we initially thought there would be um and then overall what frank did largely behind the scenes was compile the a big literature review on how's the plumbing of these whole things work and what's the hydrology and what are the dynamics here and i just wanted to mention also that yeah we had these 30 sites where we did all this you know amazing amount of work but we also had a, probably another 60 sites that we we gained tacit knowledge on um, when I lead another project that we're just finishing up now, remapping the soils of the 11 point district, which is, it's about a three or 400,000 acre area. So it doesn't define the whole range of fens, but it's a good chunk. And so w in that process, we got to really go through fens in every kind of condition you can imagine. And that really helped again, build our tacit understanding. And so, yeah, um... With that information and kind of the previous uh, experiences too, we were starting to look at the broad geology and hyd the hydrology of these patterns. And so really we've talked about karst, but I'm gonna define it for you now. Uh, essentially this is limestone and dolomite bedrock, or carbonate rock. This is basically sedimentary rock that is greater than 50% calcite or argonite. And so um, the unique thing about uh, karst landscapes is uh, rainfall will erode this rock uh, along fractures and faults over millennia. And so that develops this karst landscape, which includes sinkholes, losing and gaining streams, caves, springs, glades, and I'll submit karst fins are also a component of this landscape. And so karst, you know, is distributed differently across the United States. If you look in the Appalachians and even in, on the East Coast or in Florida, there are some carbonate uh, outcroppings uh, but there's this big bullseye here in the Ozarks uh, of Missouri and northern Arkansas as well. But there's examples of, of carbonate rock elsewhere in the um, uh, Rockies as well as western Texas. But by and large, it's 16 percent of the of the United States. So when we look here in Missouri, it's a much higher proportion of, of the geology of, of the region. And so it's a great place to uh, dive into this. Now, not all karst is created equal. Um, we've got uh, karst that is, you know, 500 years or 500 million years old to uh, the younger, more Pennsylvanian uh, age is closer to 300 million years. And so that's a big difference in terms of the time in which water has to work across this landscape. And so when we think about the uh, plateau, uh, the, the, the Ozark Highlands, essentially you've got water that's been working across uh, the surfaces and these soils over time. And so um, basically the surficial weathering. And I'm going to kind of toss it back over to Kyle real quick to, to touch on that. Sure, I'll just hit home there that that area there in the, the dark blue, um, you know, the, the kind of rind around that, that is, those are the oldest landscapes of the Ozarks and really of North America, if you think about it. And so those areas have had the most time to weather. Um, they also have uniquely in the Ozarks, we have a couple different bedrock formations that are really poised to develop a lot of epikarst in the landscape. So um, unconsolidated material that really 
is a catchment for water to be retained in an aquifer. And we have some, a lot of factors coming together in that area to produce kind of a, a ripe area ripe for fen formation. Excellent. And yeah, and so some of this we can see in terms of, if you look at the red lines, this is false, uh, essentially the fracture frequency. And so you'll see that lines up also with that really old and weathered system. And so essentially we have layers of sedimentary rock, kind of like a birthday cake, that's on top of an uneven basement of igneous rock. And so you've got the St. Francis Mountains that have been uplifting at different times over the years, uh, cracking essentially that sheet cake. And so with the fracture frequency, it is also uh, not distributed evenly. And so it really centered around uh, the St. Francis Mountains. And so we see that also with that fracture frequency uh, with the uh, underlying faults and the, the stream alignment. And so you've got water, you've got geologic fracturing, and you got time. And Kyle mentioned this term epicarst, which is basically a highly weathered surface. You've got vertical and horizontal fractures. This is a great example at Johnson shut-ins that was uh, uncovered uh, with that lake uh, dam uh, demolishing. But it gives you a really nice, all this, these cavities that are uh, underneath the, and lining the bedrock, which water can move horizontally and, and, and uh, vertically. And so when we look at the geologic uh, controls of where uh, fins exist, 83% of the known locations uh, fall within four geologic units, the Rubidoux, the Gasconade, Eminence, and Potosi. And this is acknowledging that we've got a lot of fins that are not mapped in the landscape. But you can really see uh, these factors really do kind of uh, help with the distribution of, of where fins exist today. So if we're thinking about the Ozark Highlands, we often think about the crystal clear waters, the streams, and these big springs. And really, those this hydrology is uh, reflective of this leaky lithology of karst. And so um, it's important to kind of think about hydrology when you think about wetlands, because um, basically where water is coming from will affect these different wetland types. And so groundwater really drives springs, fins, and seeps. Uh, precipitation is what's driving the hydrology of um, sinkhole ponds and wet prairies, uh, whereas in our bigger river systems, overland flow is often what's contributing to these riverine uh, the habitats. But there's this always kind of this ebb and flow, um, and not everything's uh, clean in, in terms of uh, sometimes you've got groundwater that's also contributing to riverine habitats. Um, but it's important when we're thinking regionally uh, what the variation is. And in the Ozarks, um, groundwater is really key in the, the wetlands that are in this part of the, of the world. And so knowing that, we uh, talked with the folks at the Spring Stewardship Institute. Uh, they have this great uh, spring classification system uh, that the Forest Service has also adopted and incorporated into their groundwater dependent ecosystem level one inventory. And so uh, once again, trying to build off of what's already been done uh, and what has been found useful by uh, our partners. And so um, using this classification system, when we think about, say, Greer Spring and, you know, these big springs that are most visible, we think, you know, these things are piped uh, surface flow with high flow magnitude. Uh, the persistence of flow is perennial. And the spring type is in these emerging pools or called a, a limnocrine spring. Well, that's on one end of the spectrum. And there's a whole wide gradient of ways water comes out of the ground, essentially. And so if we think about this gradient of uh, spheres of discharge, um, we'll find these different parameters. And we wanted to kind of put that into context uh, for karst fins. And so where we find, uh, in terms of surface flow, instead of being piped, our karst fins are diffuse groundwater discharge. So basically, the soil is maintaining some saturation, and it's just kind of spreading out uh, underneath the soil surface. Occasionally, you can find some areas of small concentrated discharge. This example at Allen Branch is probably six inches in and in just a little trickle of water. When we're thinking about magnitude of flow, uh, there is a little bit of velocity here uh, as water is moving through the uh, wetlands. Sometimes you can see these little rivulets or streamlets but typically the velocity is minimal enough for the roots to keep the organic matter in place. 
When we think about persistence of flow, um, where you may have some uh, uh, wet weather springs or seeps, um, these are on the other end of the spectrum and are actually closer to uh, you know, your larger uh, high discharge springs. Saturation is persistent because it builds up over time, uh, it allows that organic matter to build up over time. And these soils are often um, quite saturated and do not show signs of drying out. Uh, on the periphery, you might have some periodical drying uh, during extreme heat or drought periods, but by and large, these things are staying wet and saturated for years, if not hundreds of years uh, or thousands of years on, on, at, at a time. Now, spring type. How does water come out of the ground? Helicrine spring is a fancy way of saying it manifests itself in this um, wetland soils, it's wetland soil development, where you've got water just kind of diffusely spreading out and this mucky uh, mud, essentially, when you step into it. Occasionally, like I said, you can find some small channels or it may happen on a, on a hill slope of a high uh, degree slope. However, um, by and large, the primary type is with this, uh, these wetland conditions. And so, and that's because you have this impermeable layer dictating lateral flow that basically hits a slope and that those soils are saturated and then at some point the strata drops out and water disappears again. Um, but it's that uh, saturation over time in which organic soils build up and, and Kyle will get into this a little bit further. Landscape position is highly variable, but this um, essentially uh, sideways uh, moving water is, is consistent across sites. Um, when we think about watershed context, 89% of these occur in zero to three order streams. And so this is typically in sections where uh, losing streams shift to gaining uh, streams. And so that tells you a little bit about what's going on hydrologically. Um, and also higher in the watershed, this is all local uh, flow. This is not water that's crossing um, uh, watershed catchment boundaries. And so this is also kind of an interesting distinction in the fact that Zero to three order streams is also the same scale at which beavers work most efficiently. These are small uh, streams in which they can dam up and control. And if there's, you know, water gushing out of the side, they're able to, uh, even if it's through saturated soils, they're able to take advantage of that as well. Uh, another distinction is, so those big springs that we, we often think of in the Ozarks, like Greer Spring, um, these are uh, obtaining water from regional, regional inputs and crossing the different uh, watershed boundaries. And so um, this is important in a distinction from further up north where in glaciated till, uh, fins are more likely to receive regional uh, water inputs. But through the uh, studies that have been done here in the Ozarks, uh, Tom Ailey and others showed that a lot of that recharge, quite honestly, uh, was from the adjacent uplands. So 60, 100 acres immediately above these fins. And so that local input is really important and kind of what also makes what uh, these fins distinct. So when you kind of think about it, um, think about this headwater catchment as a big orange bucket, essentially filled with all this weathered soil that's been uh, sitting here weathering for 500 million years. Uh, and then you put um, a, a fin down at the bottom of this as a uh, sponge Water's infiltrating all this um, um, material and it creates this perched aquifer. Well, instead of being further downstream in these large karst conduits, basically these cave systems, that's not what go what's going on up here in this weathered soil system. No, this is actually more, if you think about like a bunch of pins in the bottom of uh, uh, a gallon baggie, that essentially water is leaking through, moving through that weathered soil and discharging into the sponge. And so this sponge is uh, staying saturated for this long period of time. It's slowly draining that perched aquifer. And then um, over time, you get these seasonal rains every spring that's refilling that aquifer and therefore maintaining that uh, perennial discharge because of the, the low flow in the fin. And so that kind of gives you an idea of the, the hydrology. And so now I'm gonna turn it over to Kyle to jump into uh, the soils uh, that uh, we really dug into. All right, soils, just to 
hopefully everyone's on the edge of their seat here. Um, I'm sure some of you are, but no, this is uh, really Im Im impressive or important stuff that we came up with with this the soil site analysis. We're going to transition a little bit. I'm going to talk specifically about kind of summarizing the basic results of the 30 sites that we sampled. And this is really groundbreaking. Um, Fen soils are largely uh, unstudied and certainly haven't been studied in any formal kind of setting, for example, through soil survey or natural resources conservation service. So um, we set out to do the kind of thing that you would need to do to, to document these soils. And so sampling was really interesting. It was very muddy, as you can imagine. Um, you know, typically with something like this, we might want to use a backhoe. Uh, obviously, we're not going to do that. So we came up with some some methods just simply using a tarp with a hole cut in it. That is amazing at just kind of keeping your body weight above so you're not smashing vegetation or compacting the soil. So just little things like that worked out really well. We use a variety of tools. Um, we, we, we came up with the idea to, to cut PVC pipes in half. And then we would take each horizon out, carefully replace it on uh, the, the PVC pipe. And then from there on, we can describe the soil and we could sample it. And so that's basically what we did um, when it comes to all the work we did on this project, doing this work, the time and money it, it took to, to sample and then to analyze the data. We sent our, our uh, soil samples to the, to the uh, lab at Lincoln and some at the University of Missouri. Um, Go ahead, Frank. So, um, so with a soil site analysis, we usually we talk about soils, geology, uh, landforms, and, and those kinds of things. So, uh, from the thirty sites, we found what we had expected. Now, this isn't necessarily a completely random sample. Uh, the thirty sites that we selected, but I would argue if we selected thirty more that were random, we would find similar results. We would have the gasconade and eminence dolomite formations being dominant in what, in what we find. Um, those, just because you're in the gasconade or the eminence or the whatever it is, it doesn't mean that you're not heavily impacted of, in terms of what's above you. So usually these fens are often occurring, like for example, right where the Rubidoux and gasconade formation meet. The Rubidoux formation is known for having a lot of epicarst and a, a lot of um, sinkholes and other recharge features in the landscape that then come down in and, and get into unweathered dolomite and the gasconade dolomite. And so that's usually where we find it is right in that that precipice of you going from a losing stream to a gaining stream where you might start finding seeps and springs in unweathered dolomite, uh, whereas above that you wouldn't see any of that. And so that's about the point where you expect to see fens and we were not surprised by this result. Um, Landforms, uh, you know, that whole helicrine spring thing with diffuse flow flowing through the soil, not channelized spring channels, but diffuse groundwater flow, that can happen. It's also so, something we call preferential flow. It's going to happen where it happens. Uh, one, something you'll hear me say probably again is fens do what they want. They don't follow any rule books. And so Normally, you might expect an ecological site to have a lot of repeatability when it comes to landforms. Well, that's not the case in fens. Uh, wherever that helicrine spring pops out, whether it's a side slope, foot slope, or terrace, that's where the fen is going to develop. Uh, however, I will say that the vast majority of fens probably were historically on terraces, and these ones on side slopes and foot slopes may be a little bit oversampled in this case because those are often the sites that are rockier and maybe weren't, um, uh, they stand out in terms of their reference condition because they weren't converted to agricultural purposes. And I will say that usually the fens, these fens come out on the opposite side of where the current modern day stream channel is. So that picture there, that cross section is very uh, accurate. And so when it comes to soil properties, believe it or not, soils have their own taxonomy just like plants and animals do so when you pick a you know a carex species you know justin's going to go through a process to add to key it out you do the same thing with the soil pet on and so we're looking at these are just you know six or seven properties on our right 
These are some of the main ones that we look at for fens. There's many more, and I won't go through in detail what they are, but really obvious things like what is the textural category? How much rock is there? What kind of water table? Um, these are the things that define a taxonomic class or a soil series. Um, Moloch and Histic, I might just take a moment to define that briefly because that's really important. These are two organic enriched types of soil horizons that occur in fens. A Moloch sur uh, horizon is a really dark, you know, dark brown to black colored horizon that has organic enrichment in the mineral soil itself. And the reason that's developing is because the conditions are so wet that it doesn't cycle. So it's actually accumulating uh, on the site. And then to an extreme extent, you turn into a histic where you might have a Moloch uh, surface, but it's so wet that you're actually not able to really cycle anything. And so you're building up organic material above that mineral surface. And so those are two, that's what we really call organic soil or muck or peat or mucky peat in that case. And so check this out. Don't worry about all the, you know, the details of the words, but look at the numbers for each of these properties that I picked out. That is a ton of variability. And typically in soil classification, we don't want to see variability. If we go to 30 sites, which is a lot, uh, if we did 30 sites of virtually any other ecological site I could imagine, we would have a lot of, of, of continuity and not much variation, at least not variation like this. So, um, you know, it's it. this is what would give a traditional soil scientist that some, does soil mapping, uh, you know, a real headache. So there's a lot of variation, um, but that's okay. Uh, go ahead. Um, so one thing I wanted to point out in my experience Wetland soils are not well represented in soil taxonomy. It just is what it is. Um, I think NRCS has has established that fairly well because they have other um, guidance documents that I'll talk about in a minute. But number two, the so there are in other words, there are wetland soil properties that are occurring that really aren't being accounted for well in taxonomy. So that's okay, but it makes it challenging. And then finally, what I wanted to point out here is that this variability supports our overriding conclusion that fens all started as a different kind of ecosystem. They became wet when the helicrine spring discharged onto that site. All fens were once forests or woodlands for the most part, and then they became wet. And now you have all these kind of relic properties that uh, are getting wet and building new properties in many cases and, and becoming fens. And so the thing that we really relied on, in addition to taxonomy, we still have to go through that process, but NRCS has a wonderful guide that helps people that do wetland delineations, the hydric soil indicators. And so think about what unifying characteristics there are, and there are some that are consistent across all fens. Num number one is all karst fens sh show some kind of organic enrichment, and that can be with that Moloch development that I talked about with mineral soil that's wet, that's accumulating organic matter. It can also be because of organic development, like I talked about that histic concept. But there's a third type of soil too that's that's right in the middle. We call it uh, mucky mineral soils. So all those things are well identified in the hydric soil indicators and, and all fence have one or all, some fence have all three of them and some fence have one or two of them. And then all, almost all good fens should have a gray colored subsoil. It should be black below a really light colored gray or white, even whitish colored soil, which indicates permanent saturation, redoxomorphic, uh, uh, reduced environment. Um, and so pay attention, like you don't have to be an expert in soils to know that these colors are telling you something. Look for dark colors, look for light colors, look for grays, look for you know reds or oranges. Those are all telling you different things. And so I'm gonna go through, uh, I thought, you know, we really spent time on looking at these soils. I wanted to get good photos of each soil pet on, which is, you know, each each soil it, with its horizons showing in a photo here. Um, so I wanna go through some pictures. You can see real world, uh, rare opportunity here for you to see what a fen soil looks like. 
Um, so for example, the, 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 you might even, some of you might notice some of the site names, but this, the site on the left is Dunrovin. You'll notice that zero to 10 centimeter horizon that's really dark, that's an organic surface. It grades into the, the next horizon down, which is also dark, but not quite as dark. That's a mollic surface. Then it goes into that depleted matrix, as we call it, that gray zone. And then it actually gets drier as you go down the soil profile because that water is moving laterally across the surface so quickly that it really isn't quite as operative as you go down in depth. So take a look at some of those. And, and then here's some additional sites. The site on the right, shut in Mountain Fen, we've also found some really interesting stuff. At about 60 centimeters there, we have a fen soil that was buried by another fen soil. So it was a fen, it got buried through some geologic process, not by man, That was this is old, and, and then it became a fen again. Uh, the two sites on the left here, Coonville, these are sites that also have buried horizons. The one way on the left, we believe, was actually a glade at one point that became that had some kind of weird deposits on it very odd uh, and then it became wet um, and then the one on the right is uh, both of those are bedrock controlled by the way as well that's why they're so shallow and then the probably the cover model of all the fen soils that we've ever seen is lead mines one there where you have everything every property you could possibly imagine in a fen uh, from a perched water table you know, again, with that lateral flow uh, where it gets virtually dry soil down below about 130 centimeters. And then you have a, a organic surface, you got a mile, you got everything on that one. And so that one uh, just, it just is a, a pretty neat looking soil there. But in reality, the, the, the most, the modal concept is these two books, one's bookended on the left and right. Um, B Fork and Barton are great examples of a of, this is a taxonomic class, fine loamy siliceous active mesic histic endoaqual. It's a soil series that we're going to propose to NRCS. We're going to call it B fork. Hopefully, they accept that. Uh, basically, a, a site that has a, a, about an eight-inch uh, organic surface with a mollic horizon, and then it doesn't dry up. It just stays wet all the way to the bottom. So, pretty uh, simple-looking soil in reality. But we're going to propose that as a new series. And we wanted to age fen soils. And um, there's lots of concepts and theories about how old fens are. And uh, so we radiocarbon dated some of them. And go go ahead, Frank. Yeah, so you know, if they have relic species uh, from uh, the last ice age, we were wondering, well, have they been around that long? And it was really interesting. Um, we took uh, soil samples at different places in the profile uh, with the hope that we would be getting older soils as we went further down. And uh, good news, our sampling technique worked, and uh, that's what we found. Um, uh, we did not find uh, soils that were as old as perhaps we might think, but uh, basically the oldest being 6,000 years old at lead mine. Uh, but if you think about it with the hypsothermal, that would have been the, uh, the uh, warmest, driest period of time, and that basically created a backstop in which organic matter uh, dried up and decomposed uh, prior to that. And so uh, that kind of provides that backstop, but really uh, the average age was 2000 years old. And so uh, that really was kind of eye opening and made us kind of rethink the ecological dynamics over time. Um, and so, yeah, Kyle, you kind of alluded to it earlier in, in the presentation. You want to hit it again in terms of what that yeah, means? Basically, fens develop at different time intervals. Whenever they became wet, that's when the fens started. These aren't necessarily relic ecosystems but they're newer ecosystems that are composed of a, a lot of relic biota and ecological processes. Exactly. So that was pretty fascinating and, and uh, kind of a fun puzzle to put together. But then also when we think about carbon stocks um, uh, globally, um, it's interesting to kind of compare what we have here in the Ozarks with other places. So if you think about peatland soils uh, to the north, um, essentially you've got some soils that may be 7,000 years old. So, um, and, Therefore, as things thaw out, um, that's at risk of decomposing. Um, when we think about the tropics, um, the, the above ground biomass is where a lot of the carbon is stored, uh, basically in the trees. And so when we think about where we are here in the mid-latitude uh, state of Missouri um, and where the carbon stock is, 
uh, in our system, we have the trees that are surrounding and providing the above ground biomass. But when we think about the soils here, they really are true hotspots of um, carbon. And so um, that run the full gamut of, you know, a few hundred years to several thousand years old. And so these really are kind of unique spots that we should uh, value for not just their biodiversity, but also uh, as carbon sinks. Go ahead and bust through all these um, conclusions, Frank, to, so we can move on. But just in conclusion for, with the soils, uh, organic soils have never been documented in Missouri. They will be now. Um, focus on ecological processes, not taxonomy. Uh, the process is, is a semi-permanent to permanent water table with mineral enriched water. And fence do what they want. They develop at different rates, which is variable over time and space. And uh, that really is the definition of, of a karst fence soil. And I'll let um, Justin uh, carry on here with the, the findings of our plant analysis. Thanks guys for laying in the foundation for the vegetation. Um, uh, yeah, real quick, we're, we're kind of running out of time, but I'm just going to hit the highlights, the more interesting elements of this. Uh, fens, floristically composed of, we tend to think of them, talk about them as being uh, uh, harboring northern disjuncts. And about 18 out of the 43 restricted plants of our fens are, oh, go ahead and advance, Brian. Uh, <clears throat> but five out of 43 are, are primarily southern disjuncts, Ludwigia microcarpa, Parnassia grandif grandifolia are good examples of that, of these southern influences. Then you have coastal influences, things that kind of occur along the coastal plain, more northern and eastern influences, and then more just sort of eastern, southern influences as well. So it's not really accurate to necessarily think of our fins in the Midwest, as, or in Missouri, as being uh, harbors or northern relics although they are but they also hold just like like kind of kyle alluded to there's so much variability and the age uh, uh, of these things are in question there's still sort of a lot of phytogeographical trends going on they're just sort of these sticky traps that hold whatever comes into them if it can handle wet calcareous soils they tend to persist in those regions um and every fin every fin is different so when the data we analyze the data from all these sites we found the same variation that we found with the soils. In fact, that was kind of the only correlation is they vary both kind of not together, but independently in very, very odd ways. Um, and a lot of that just comes from isolation. I mean, a lot of these fins are very isolated. A lot of them are older than others. Slope position is going to change a lot of the expression of the plants and the potential for colonization from other areas. Uh, legacy impacts, as we'll get into, some of these sites have had a little more impact than others have in the past. Um, but ultimately, what we did find is because with these site ecological descriptions, you need you need sort of a, a species name to classify it with. What are the dominant species that sort of classify this karst fin that we're trying to give a to give a name to or a, a, a description to? And these are the six species that were consistently found pretty much in every fin. These are the good if you want you want to call them fin indicators. These are the, the are great examples of that and one of them Eleocris elliptica is, is was new to the state and it's actually one of our defining species uh plants soil interactions one of the one of the interesting things we did find from the data with the soils and the plants is that the lower the carbon nitrogen ratio the higher the biomass and that that kind of relates to to even soils outside of outside of fins when you get below a certain carbon nitrogen ratio, it usually means you have a lot of nitrogen, which means you're going to have a weedier flora, and so you're going to get a higher biomass. And it's the same reason you you put nitrogen on plants to get them to grow bigger. Um, and when that would happen, we'd have a higher proportion of things like Georgia bulrush, common bone set, Apios americana. The C values are there along with those, and some of those. This is the kind of work that we can look at something like Apios americana and say, wow, that C value is six. And it's kind of an indicator of more beat up places. Maybe that C value is a little too high. And patients, capensis, cursed granularis. So these are, these are in, in reality, this is kind of about as weedy as it gets, if you want to use the word weedy, as it gets in a fin because they're so wet and they're so calcareous that not a lot of regular weeds can also be wet and calcareous, you know? So it's a, it's a, it's a small pool to, to draw from by the very nature uh, of, of the fin itself. 
and then mosses. We looked at mosses too. Uh, lots of indicators of of chemistry. John Atwood helped us with this uh, later on. We're just now trying to process this a little more. Um, I think Frank pulled some people in um, to to get to get an idea how to interpret mosses a little better. That's ongoing and becoming very interesting. And then, and then sort of taking that vegetation and the soils data, we, we tried to condense this into what are called state and transition models. And the state and transition models are basically, you got about, if you follow me to the left, to the right here on the screen, you have a reference state, sort of the stable climax system, the way the system would be if it were left untouched over long periods of time, what it would become, nutrient poor, stable sort of thing. And then it's impacted. We got to say, okay, what is it? What happens to an open fin when it's impacted? It becomes this vegetation type. And then if it's impacted anymore, it becomes even more degraded. And so we'll just kind of go through. That was part of this whole system is, is classifying what fins we have into these into this classification system. So we can use it for reference and say, okay, if you want to see what a good open fin looks like, go to this site. If you want to see one that's impacted, go to this site. And there's a list of the sites that we used um, and what their categories were. To explain those a little bit, so a, a, a reference state, a one, a, a community phase one, one is an open fin. This is sort of the classic uh, fin that you think of low productivity. The dominant species are going to be Rebecca fulgida, Helenium autumnale, and Carrick's interior. Low productivity, no trees, no shrubs, just sort of an open, sedgy looking, but usually more forbs actually than sedges. Just the sed sedges kind of steal the show. Um. And then there's the, there's, here's a picture. So Blair, Blair Creek raised fin is a good example of a one, one open fin. We go to a, to a closed fin. So still a community phase one, which is reference state. Closed fin is gonna be the two. And this is where we get some shrubs or trees growing in. And this is usually where the soils express such that there's hummocks or in a floodplain where there's where there's mounds and the, in the, the, wet, the wetter areas are more marbled. So you get trees growing in. You get a little different community expression where you get Bomeria cylindrica and, and Packer aria in the dominance, the top three dominant species in the site. Um, here's a picture of a closed fin. This is hidden fin. That's all. That's predominantly Carexy morii, uh, the the site there, which is really fun. Um, then there's a then there we, we would classify it as a marsh fin. A marsh fin is a, again a reference state. And but a wetter community, you can kind of see on the on the profile here. If you move left to right, you start getting a little deeper, and, and that usually corresponds to things like beaver dams or pooling of various sorts. And the water not only becomes a little deeper, but because it becomes a little further from the charge point and it's gone through all this sort of acidic organic matter, it becomes a little less calcareous. So you start picking up things like uh, uh typha, a lot of foliage, cattails, Georgia bulrush. But these are still good indicators, and they usually mix in with good fin species um, in there as well. Here's an example of a karst fin. Uh, there's uh, that's Nathan Aaron standing in it. That he's standing in what's called an open fin. But as you walk across that fin, there's a literal like a six inch drop right where you see there's a dark green cattail sort of line, and that's a marsh fin. You go downstream about 50, 60 meters, and there's a beaver dam. Not this beaver dam, but there's one like it that's impounding that and creating a marsh fin, which is a totally different sort of community type and a predictable patternable uh, phenomenon across the landscape. Um, and this is like Hodge hollow fin. Same thing, you can see there's a beaver dam on the front end of it. Um, yeah, Kyle, uh, you want to kind of touch on this real briefly. Yeah, I would just say that that image on the right in our 11 point mapping project, we started seeing these things using aerial photo recon and, uh, you know, blue water, beavers, you know, herbaceous wetlands. And we're realizing that this really repeats. Yeah, exactly. And so in our low lying locations, we realized that, hey, we had abandoned beaver dams in some locations. We had buried wood in the soil. So here's a 5,000 year old chunk of wood from Barton Fen. Um, and then if we start thinking about what are the implications of beaver density um, in the past versus today, we would have had a lot more beavers on the landscape, which would have increased the water table as well as the diversity of the habitats. So the range of species adapted to groundwater discharge, like our fin associated species, 
are likely to be much more widely spread historically. And so, as uh, Justin mentioned, we have this flushing system and this open fin, but uh, when you have beavers come onto the system and pond water, suddenly your nutrients aren't moving out and your some dilution. And so uh, you have this different, differentiation uh, manifested in the uh, plant communities itself. Yeah, and I, I saw a few I saw a few things pop into the chat about cattails being invasive in other parts of the world. I want to address that real quickly. In the Ozarks, yeah. ty Typha latifolia is a pretty uh, benign member of, of our of our wetland communities. It hasn't been hybridized with Angustifolia and formed this Typha x glauca thing, which is the more invasive one. So our our fin Typha latifolia is a very well behaved. It acts like a spark. It's it's less colony forming than Sparganium, oftentimes. Um, yes. So our good type of lot of foley is a totally different thing. And, and in this yeah. system, once again, tied to the nutrients and that flushing. Yeah. Typho, yeah, yeah. Typho will play nice with others. It's, it's yeah. the first example that I have actually ever seen it. So uh, realizing it can be a monoculture in other places in our fin systems, if it's not degraded, uh, it will play nicely with others and have a diversity of other plant species. Yeah, I bet, I bet if you dumped a bunch of nitrogen in there, totally different game. But yeah, then again, everything exactly. else is going to be metabolically uh anachronistic it's going to fall out type is going to maybe go nuts anyway oh but yeah so uh impacted systems people moved into this landscape in the in the late eight or late late 1800 well late yeah 1700s early 1800s and started impacting these but people want spring houses they want you know a thin pool or if you're going to pound a little bit of water these are places where your livestock can feed you need water these are sort of becoming some of the first impacted sites definitely in the landscape um, and when you start impacting fins, what you often see is that nutrient change that we're talking about. So you go from these low productivity systems to these damage systems that have basically the, the soil start, the microbes start eating the, the uh, carbon out of the soil and changing the nitrogen balance. And they become these biomass rich things, which they, make, they become open to colonization from woody species. And pretty soon you've just got a wet uh, woods with nothing really growing in them or they've been drained completely. We'll see examples of that as we move on. Yeah, a lot of our wetland, a lot of our fins in the landscape are now just sort of wet pastures with some remnant quality, but not much. Some of them are shrubbed in. These are these are impacted forms of the 1-1 one, one state. Uh, shrub closed. Yeah, we'll keep moving. Uh, more of a tree closed. This is like another one. This, was, this could, potentially could have been an open fin historically. It was impacted. The nitrogen balance thrown off and it becomes woody. Submerged fins, uh, lots of uh, uh, artificial impounding of waters will, will, will close up and, and immediately impact uh, a lot of these fins. Other structural alterations being uh, soil disturbance again. Hogs are a big problem that's making an impact currently. Again, changing nutrients as well. Um, uh orv use you know a lot of fins people think is a great place to uh think it's a swamp that they get to go mudding in so we get impact from that changes all kinds of things as anyone can imagine one of the big things that we found in the in the in the study that was more one of the more interesting things is soil removal this is like shut in mountain fin and it's always been known as a as a as a marl fin because it has this really marly zone in the middle where there's no real soil and just sort of rock exuding uh, calcium wet calcium rich water onto the landscape We're, when we look at those soils when kyle and, and, and dennis meyer looked at those soils they found that those are really beat up soils and most of the soil had been actually removed and these are these are actually some of the most beat up fins that we actually have but when you remove that organic matter you remove the buffer to the calcium and then only all, all you're left with are extreme calcifiles extreme wet calcifiles so you get what we would otherwise consider as great fin indicators as remnants because it's all, it's literally toxic to most plants. You any other weed couldn't survive in that landscape. So the weeds in these situations are the opposite. It's a real it's a real juxtaposition of of, of fins. Yeah, and so one thing in terms of marl, um, the the term marl is is kind of ambiguous. Uh, tufa is a, another term for calcite precipitate, and so we saw this on other uh, locations as well. This is Caps Hollow where. Essentially, we it looked like there was a head cut that had formed 
and basically eroded all of the organic soil. Um, and therefore, you just had this kind of gravel side slope in which calcite was uh, being deposited. Um, and basically, um, that happens when you have water that is super saturated, which can be facilitated by exposed rock and high temperatures. And so we had rock that actually had tufa concentrations on the outside, kind of like a whopper. Um, and so this is really the exception rather than the norm in terms of having tufa and marl in Missouri. It does happen uh, clearly as we, we saw, but it, it's not necessarily a reference condition as, as uh, seen in other places around the world. And so we typically saw this in more of a disturbed soil setting. Um, now tufa and calcite precipitate can happen in karst springs and streams. It requires the right geochemical conditions, as we can see from this picture from Tufa Creek. Um, but typically in our, our fins, it's, it's more of an anomaly. And so anyway, this is also was kind of an interesting uh, thing that uh, we've kind of uncovered. And like uh, Justin said, in these situations, you have these extreme calcifiles. And in terms of other mo uh, modifications, you, of course, have uh, drainages that uh, cut and have, have basically diverted the water away from uh, concentrated flow or created concentrated flow and um, really dried things out. Sorry, Justin, I'll, I'll toss it back to you if we go through. Okay, yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so these, and then there's the agriculturally altered landscape so you've got cattle grazing fescue does pretty well in these fins surprisingly uh, um, and a lot of other weedy grasses especially since they've been dewatered considerably reconary grasses and a few of our our, our fins but even then it, it doesn't go nuts like it does in in more rich again nitrogen being the driver in those impoundments one of the biggest fin complexes in in the ozarks was converted into a lily pad farm in the 1950s or 60s or something um there's hope of, of, of reconstructing that I, I i hear but yeah that's another major impact and so yeah that kind of brings us into the transition models essentially and so some of the takeaway homes here as we wrap things up in terms of management and restoration is when we consider these places um we need to remember that this isn't your ordinary forest or this isn't your ordinary grassland or not even your ordinary wetland. Um, and so we need to adjust our expectations uh, and our actions in and around our, these fins accordingly. And so I'll touch on some of these things. Ground and water hydrology is different. You cannot recreate it. Ditches and roads, uh, any diversions, quite honestly, are not good. Levees and water control structures are also aren't going to get you what you want uh, in a fin. And so undoing diversions like plugging a ditch, notching a road, keeping that water going out and spreading out is important to restore that subsurface flow uh, to increase that discharge within the fin. Stopping head cuts is also something we really discovered. Um, you, we're not wanting to pond water, we're wanting to water to spread out along that vegetation and that organic soil so that um, there are places where there may be these little rivulets that's forming a head cut and actually dewatering the site and leading to soil subsidence. And so having maybe a little log across a spot to form a, uh, a uh, to cop, stop that head cut is, is something to be considering. And then also don't create a head cut by having a ton of people out there tromping through making this uh, compacted uh, trail. So reducing impact of foot traffic or vehicles is really important. Um, maybe in the summer during a dry year, you could go out there, but uh, uh, using a tarp or plywood sheeting is probably something we need to be considering when we're trying to uh, be out there to reduce the soil disturbance. And then keep wild hogs and cows out with fencing. Goats, I'll put a big quotation here, may be okay in degraded sites. Um, they aren't as heavy as cows. Uh, we've seen them in a couple locations. Um, it's not an active endorsement necessarily because of the sensitivity to soil disturbance, but in a degraded site, they could potentially keep some of the shrubs out. And then also finally thinking about the surrounding landscape. The recharge area occurs immediately adjacent in the, in the uplands. And so when we're thinking about nutrients that may be flowing down or water infiltration, so like stocking rate perhaps, those are some considerations on how that may impact uh, the fin that's downstream or downslope. And then 
soil saturation is really buffering the heat from fire. Fire in these systems, even though it's a Ozark system, fire is secondary uh, in, in a fin system. Thinking about the isolated plants and insect populations within a fin is some of that considerations with when fire comes. Those, those little uh, insects need leaf litter to overwinter. And so that's really important not to burn everything. Uh, additionally, having a little bit of litter removed uh, can benefit other species. So there's this trade-off. Mosses need that light that uh, might be covered up uh, if there's really dense uh, litter. And then also thinking about uh, fire, I caution head fires to not purposely dry out the soil moisture within a fin. That could influence the nutrients that you're just, and, and encourage woodies. If you're drying the whole thing out, you be, could be increasing the very woodies that you're trying to, to keep from uh, encroaching. And land use history is also really important maybe have overlooked and the reason why uh, you have woody encroachment in these locations. And so in conclu conclusion, Kyle, do you wanna uh, wrap it on up? Yeah, sure. Well, thank you everyone for your patience. Obviously we have a lot to cover, uh, pretty hard to cover it in a short amount of time. So we built off this foundational work. We're gonna build a new site description. We've got a distribution map. That's something new to, to fens in the Ozarks. Uh, we highlighted some of the nuances between these various natural communities. We've documented new plant species. We're going to establish a new soil series. Um, we we're going to have some direction on management and restoration. And then we're going to have publications and workshops. So look forward to that. Um, again, we, we went a little long. Thank you for your patience. We will have some time for questions. I know for Frank and Justin and I, we'll, we'll talk fens all day. So um, <laughs> we'll, we'll pu put it back to Erica. Thank you. This is Carol. And uh, thank you so much, the three of you. It's wonderful, just amazing to have your expertise covering so many facets of uh, another uh, series of national communities that makes Missouri that much more special. We do have a number of questions, and I'll try to get through as many of, of them as I can. Um, and this was something, Frank, you mentioned early on that that I think you used an acronym. I'm not sure if everybody is aware, but um, we have a comment here about, I have read that because of the recent Supreme Court Waters of the U.S. decision, or sometimes known as WOTUS, uh, short for Waters of the U.S., Missouri no longer has a regulatory process for wetlands. Does something need to be done to address this? And what is your recommendation if so? And I think that would be a question for you, Frank. And yes, maybe you no, could just give a real brief background on what Waters of the U.S. is and, and how FENS figure into that. Yes, Waters of the U.S. was uh, initially put down to help protect our clean water in, in our rivers and streams. And of course, uh, our wetlands contribute to that. And so over the last 20 years, there's been... Um, Oh, uh, lawsuits on really where does that line stop? Uh, because wetlands are transitionary locations. And so um, the most recent uh, court case basically said, unless it's uh, a wetland that's permanent, connected to permanent water, then uh, it does not fall under federal regulations. And so Missouri had uh, relied upon federal regulations. We do not have uh, our own state regulations protecting wetlands. And so, um, yes, it is a big gaping hole right now uh, and um, in which wetlands could be, um, you know, further um, under threat. Unfortunately, we've already lost 90 percent of the wetlands we have in the state. And so um, a lot of the damage has already been done. But that's not to say that uh, the existing wetlands couldn't be impacted. And so, yes, uh, you know, grassroots uh, support for wetland conservation um, is, is needed um, in, in the wide range of uh, opportunities, whether it's regulations or programs to conserve those that exist. And so, yeah, there's there's a wide range of things that need to be done um, and that could be done through the various arms of government or even um, nonprofit organizations or, you know, concerned citizens like yourself. So um, a wide, wide range of things. Thank you, Frank. And, and I think Erica could put in some information about Waters of the U.S. in the email that will go out to all registrants tomorrow. And of course, you uh, can contact your federally elected officials and tell them how uh, how much you value all wetland types and how uh, this ruling is affecting them. Um, 
several questions here about beavers. Um, and maybe you could explain why aren't they as present on the landscape and should they be reintroduced in some of these areas? Sure, yeah, uh, beavers were trapped out um, in the late 1800s. Um, they work the currency essentially. Um, and so there was a lot of beavers were trapped out uh, in Missouri. We actually brought them back uh, from Minnesota about six in the 1920s, I believe. And so beaver populations have been increasing over the years, um, but we um, like to know where our water is going and beavers sometimes have their own plans. And so they have constantly been trapped out when they become a problem. And so, uh, however, in some of these remote locations, um, their populations are increasing in, in certain locations. We don't have a good idea of where they pop up. Um, and so that's something that we're learning more about. Uh, but they're definitely something I think that contributed historically to the biota. And um, in the past too, it's been kind of one of those controversial things of beavers were thought to pond water and therefore reduce the amount of habitat for Heinz Emerald Dragonfly. Uh, Heinz Emerald Dragonfly rely on burrowing crayfish. And so uh, burrowing crayfish kind of follow that saturated line. And so um, realizing there's these um, rare species, we want to, you know, protect these locations. And so beavers seem to be messing things up, but I think they're taking a, a, a broader step back. They're actually part of the system. And so um, through this work, we've kind of reframed things. And uh, I think it's, uh, you know, just reframing and thinking about where beavers are and how they may be contributing to that groundwater uh, saturation, um, they may not be as evil as we once thought, uh, essentially. And there's opportunities in these upper watersheds for beavers to do their thing. And uh, I think that'll be something that we'll be kind of looking uh, more into, not just in the Ozarks, but elsewhere where they're not impacting infrastructure, but contributing to slowing water down, increasing biodiversity, whether that's in a forest system or even a prairie system. Thank you. As another question about uh, you did you did talk about the role of fire and but uh, can you talk a bit about the history of fire in playing a factor in in the development or 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 uh, no, you know, I, can, yeah, I can take that um, yeah. you know we we don't have fire history information for these you know we could look into that um, but. We don't talk a lot about fire. Uh, the, the overriding factor is the hydrology of these sites. That's what maintains a fen. That is the that is the operative disturbance factor that creates fen conditions. And certainly, these sites burned. Um, they, it would have been a mosaic, as you can see. We think that beaver and, and marsh fens were operative, so you would have had a lot of fire breaks. It would have been variable. But um, this is not. Uh, I look at fire and fens as a restoration tool, um, not as some kind of ecological necessity. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, I think Justin and Frank would agree with that. Yeah, I agree. And if you look at some of the fire records of and fins elsewhere, um, it really did change with land use. Um, so it, they would kind of be per periodic and just kind of surficial, kind of running through and, and dying out with the dampness essentially, and not really burning into the peat itself. And so uh, with land use change, things would dry out and those your fire frequency would increase uh, and then also your woodies would increase. And so that's what we've seen uh, in fire frequency and fins elsewhere. And so that's why we really thought, you know, it is secondary here in the Ozarks. It, it does happen and it's fine to run one through as long as it's variable. And you've got some leaf litter there sure. for the insects, but that's kind of yeah. our stance. I'm, I'm going to toss my, uh, my hat in the ring here too, is in the sense that I think fins more than anywhere else. The the soil dynamics are driven by just just the, the the carbon is coming from just regular decomposition. You don't need to burn off the biomass. That the, a lot of the, most of our fins are not in any sort of burn unit, and they're perfectly fine, and they are they're doing perfectly well. They're not becoming woody. They're just stable, low nutri low nutrient systems that don't change a whole lot. But they're they're humming along on their own ecological uh, inertia, and so. I'd say don't mess with it if you don't need it, because like we have seen, if, if, if it's a dry year or something like like Frank kind of alluded to, you could burn. That's 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 peat rich soil. If it dries out, it'll go up. It'll smolder for days. 
Yeah, and, and you pointed out there are some uh, ways to protect the hydrology. At, as you said, the hydrology is the main factor here for the uh, development and perpetuation of these fens. And I would uh, say if if uh, there are a number of fens that are on uh, Forest Service land and Conservation Department land that are uh, available to visit, and if people see signs of see tire tracks or see that any kind of degradation like that, can they, um, who, who can they report this to, to help protect the hydrology of these fens? Sure, yeah, on NBC sites, um, you know, you can contact the regional biologist um, or the regional office, quite honestly, and then we can kind of get you in touch with the biologist. And so, um, yeah, absolutely. We're trying to, luckily we're reducing the number of hogs on the landscape. So hopefully you won't be encountering as much hog damage in these sites in the future. Um, and so though that damage can kind of linger. Uh, there are open scars on the landscape and take a long time to, to heal. So. Um, those, it's a, a good to report those kinds of things, uh, especially when it comes to um, uh, altering vehicles. We need to figure out a way to prevent access or try to stem that activity in those locations. Thank you. Uh, I know you had a hard stop at 520 and we're a little bit past that. Um, I did also want to mention uh, I'm sure all of you contributed to the PowerPoint, but Frank, you you have a reputation as sort of being the king of PowerPoints, and your animation was very helpful in um, helping to illustrate this very uh, complex concept. So thank you for that. Good I'm sorry deal. we couldn't get to every every uh, question, but I, I do see someone wanted to know more about your projects, your workshops you have coming out, and um, the Missouri Prairie Foundation. We will be in touch with Kyle Frank. And, and Justin, and we can relay information on our website about their um, forthcoming projects. Uh, so thank you very much, the three of you, for the incredible work that you're doing. Thanks to everyone who tuned in to learn from these uh, wonderful experts. And uh, tomorrow you will receive a link to a recording of the video so you can revisit parts that you might uh, want to um, uh, view again. And you can also always view it at the uh, Missouri Prairie Foundation's YouTube channel. Please join us on January 17th. We have a conversation with Kansas City artist, Julie Farstad. Among her work are large scale community art projects, including paintings of native plants. And she uh, has a really fascinating uh, outlook on uh, and philosophy for her artwork. We have other events, including guided hikes and an in-person Grow Native workshop in Edwardsville, Illinois on February 23rd, featuring keynote speaker, Alan Branhagen. And we invite you to check that out and other events that we have coming up. So thank you all very much for tuning in and um, huge thanks to the work that the three of you are doing and for presenting for us today. Have a good evening, everyone. Thanks, Carol, appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.